Before I begin, I would like to remind you that uh, Jörg Rowan will give the next lecture in relation to the exhibition that will be on June 26th. And this lecture will be dedicated to the Black Desert of Jordan, which is a section of the exhibition I will only mention tonight, because I would like to summarize the main ideas I intended to share through the exhibition. And for this, I will rely on the content of the exhibition itself, of course, but also on a few additional portraits of pioneers and historical moments. So let's start with someone you won't see in the exhibition, actually, because the exhibition focuses on Isaac Scholar's pioneers of aerial archaeology, but as a French and presenting history of aerial archaeology in West Asia, it's almost my duty to at least mention Antoine Poidobar, who was one of the pioneers who shaped the discipline. So the title of this talk is a translation of one of the techniques he experimented in 1929. Le vol sous écran de nuages, flying under a screen of clouds, as pictured in this slide. The condition were those of the end of a day in November, after heavy rains, with a low clouds cover and flying underneath, parallel to the ground. Apparently, these conditions were ideal to see the archaeological mounds of the Syrian Jazeera, but not the easiest to reproduce, as you can imagine. But this is thanks to this kind of early experimentation tried over and over during the early days of aerial archaeology that the discipline became useful and successful. So aerial archaeology is a bit more than a century old. By far, we have discovered more archaeological sites with aerial photography than with any other survey method on the ground. This is incomparable. But this is not the only purpose of aerial archaeology, far from that. It's also an invaluable asset for archaeology in, a, in general and for heritage management and a tool that became essential for landscape archaeology, and I will come back to that later. But to understand the meaning of aerial archaeology, I will start with a quote of Crawford, pioneer of aerial archaeology in Europe, and the so-called father of the discipline. I find it difficult to express in suitable words of the importance of air photographs for archaeological study. They provide a new instrument of research comparable only to that provided by excavation. They are second only to excavation in the results they will achieve. Their invention will prove as valuable to archaeology as that of the telescope has proved to astronomy. They are not a substitute for fieldwork, but they are the most powerful ally of the field archaeologist. And actually, a great field archaeologist and former director of the Institute, William Sumner, said that when he saw an aerial photograph of the site Telemelian he, um, that Gerster had taken when the sun was low in the sky, he saw and understood more in 10 minutes than he had done in 10 years of regular work on the ground. And this is how aerial archaeology can be a powerful ally of field archaeologists. This field, aerial archaeology, couldn't have existed and thrived without pioneers, visionaries who saw the potential of these images and had breakthrough ideas to producing them, to accessing them. And at each major step of the discipline in West Asia, you can find pioneers at Isaac in the 1930s, the very early time of aerial archaeology, then during the 1990s with the development of computer-based technology, also in between during the 60s, and very recently toward the future with the use of drones and artificial intelligence. And that's why... That's one of the reasons the exhibition is about pioneers. So let's start with James Henry Breasted, 
who took the first aerial photographs for Isaac of Egyptian heritage in 1920. So only one year after he founded Isaac. This illustrates well that aerial photography is rooted in Isaac history, and I will come back to that shortly. But for now, I would like to highlight pioneers that may be less known. An earlier photograph of Giza was actually taken in 1904 by Edward Spelterini, who was a Swiss pioneer of ballooning and of aerial photography. In Sudan, a few years later, Henry Welcome, a philanthropist who was excavated Jebel, Jebel Moya, decided to use a kite to take photographs of the ongoing excavation. So these are probably the earliest photos of an excavation in North Africa. The Black Desert of Jordan is well known thanks to photographs published uh, during the 20s and that have been taken by British pilot. But a few years earlier, the Australian, the Australian Army was flying over the Black Desert and took some photographs in 1918. And they may, they have, the, sorry, they are less known, but the Australian Army and the German Army um, took wonderful photographs um, during the First World War. In the framework of the exhibition, you may have noticed that every two weeks we highlight a woman pioneer in aerial photography on the Isaac social media accounts. Tasha Wolderstrasse has found out about this wonderful trio and will post soon about them. Tonight, I'd like to highlight Mary Bailey, who was an airplane pilot pioneer. She flew back and forth from England to South Africa in 1928. During this trip, she met with archaeologist Gertrude Catton Thompson, and three years later, all together with the geologist Eleanor White Garner, they were performing, they, were, they surveyed the Harga Oasis during two weeks with an airplane. And this was published in the Antiquity Journal in 1931. So we saw with this example that since the very beginning of aerial photography, various types of devices are used for flying camera or photographers. Balloons, planes, kites, and drones nowadays. So in the exhibition, I choose to highlight the flying devices more than the techniques of taking photographs or the resolution of the photos or if oblique or vertical photographs are better than the others. Why? Because images, images taken thanks to a pole held from the ground or with sensors or bo on board satellites have a very different scale. And this imbrication of scales is crucial to fully understand the site. A settlement doesn't exist on its own. It's part of a network of a landscape and is connected to faraway sites and other landscapes. But let's start now with the scale of the site with the example of Megiddo. In Megiddo, during the 1930s, they're starting to use a ladder to capture details of ongoing excavation. And this is still a very common practice to use a pole for the same purpose and to get very high details of the architectural feature under excavation to produce accurate plans. During the preparation of the exhibition, we were very happy to find out about the very first balloon that was used in Megiddo in 1929. One flight, two good photos, and the goals were fulfilled. These only two photos um, were the beginning of several years of use with uh, more stronger balloons. And in a correspondence of Guy, who was the head of the exhibition at that time, a correspondence with Breasted, 
we learned that guy wanted to try to fly himself with a kind balloon over the site, which Breasted didn't agree with that at all, which is perfectly understandable. Why would, would it be want to do that? Because the balloon was hard to maneuver, it, and especially it was a bit tricky to keep it at the same altitude to get a good coverage of the site. But in the end, they managed to do that, and they took, by exam uh, for example, sorry, in the center, you can see um, part of the site under excavation with the, the architectural feature very visible. And they went also higher, around 400 meters from the ground, and they were able to get a picture of the entire month of Tel Megiddo. And the picture in the center, you can see the shadow of the balloon. According to Guy's publication, and also to its correspondence with Breasted, they made a great use of these photographs. They were able to complete the, the plans. They started in the field and they completed the plans with the photo in the office. They also brought the photographs in the field, in the excavation, to uh, help them to distinguish between the different layers they were excavated. And this is a tradition that is still in use in Megiddo, where they use now modern digital techniques with drones to take aerial views of the excavation and produce also wonderful 3D models. The balloon was not the um, favorite device for taking uh, aerial photographs in archaeology, and the kites were preferred. Uh, during the long durée of the, the aerial photography in the framework of aerial arch or in the framework of archaeology. And you can see here in the 1967, Robert McAdams, former uh, McCormick Adams, sorry, former director of the institute, that experimented using a kite over Nippur and Uruk. On the bottom, you can see uh, photographs of Nippur under excavation. According to Adam's field notebooks, we can learn also that kites is not always easy to manipulate. We can have uh, winds too strong or not in the enough winds on the contrary. But still, this is the device that has been favored um, instead of balloon. Also, the kites are something we can bring in the field when we are not allowed to use drones, which can be uh, still useful today. But of course, when we can use drones and also UAVs, we prefer to use that. And their onboard digital camera that allow us to uh, take a large amount of photographs of high resolution. Here you can see the excavation in Sureza and the plans, architectural plans that can be produced or complete from these photographs, so as they did in Megiddo in earlier times. Let's now change our scale of study. During the 20 and 30s, the development of aerial archaeology as a discipline, its roots, and the methods of taking photographs and of methods of survey were really achieved thanks to the use of airplanes. Airplanes also allow us to cover much larger area, so the, pur the purpose is not the same. We are here in an intention of survey and a study of the landscape. And through the aerial survey expedition in Iran, we can see that we have in the archive of, of Isaac a wonderful, wonderful documentation. So Schmidt was really um, methodic when he prepared the different flights. They drew um, by hand maps of the flight routes. They were recorded 
every flight they did and the details of the journey, also, uh, also what they saw from the plane, either natural feature, like here a lake, or of course um, architectural remains and ruins. Everything was recorded. Every uh, interesting feature was photographed also with explanation about the, um, the way the photo were taken, the altitude, if they were oblique, vertical, etc. And even if Schmidt was the head of the excavation in important sites like Persepolis of Ray, what is interesting is that he was also he has also a great interest in um, the area around these sites. And for example, he did a mapping and a survey of the plain of Persepolis. In 1937, they, they flight several times over the plain of Persepolis. They did a coverage of the entire plain. They were flying on one way and another of each part of the plain to see these uh, long strips from a side and the other. And he recorded every runes, every remains he were able to see from the plane, and he took photographs on, of every of these, of these sites. They give, they give them a number, for sure, and also they explain again how the photographs were taken, altitude, etc. And Again, in the plane itself, during the survey, he was not only interested in the main site, but also in hydraulic feature, for example, like the dam of Bandi Mayman, which is located in the south of the Persepolis plain. And for me, this was already landscape archaeology. Schmidt has already the sense to understand the big picture, and so did Poix de Bar in Syria when he was mapping the Roman Limes. So let's continue with landscape archaeology and its pioneers. You have here part of the extra small piece of the archives of Robert Marconic Adams, so former director of Isaac, as I already, already told that. And also I can see Maguire Gibson, professor of Mesopotamian archaeology. And during the 60s and the 70s, we can say that was, that was the early days of landscape archaeology. And it was a time when everything, or most, most of the, the study and most of the work was done by hands. For, for someone like me that using computer and GIS, geographic information system, and that do spatial archaeology, Thanks to a computer, it's just amazing to see that they were, they have, and they did that all by hand, like the um, size distribution of the sites and um, also all the chronological att att attribution. Which is also amazing is that in the 1970s, Gibson introduced the use of computers and he asked his students to make use of, com of computers as a new requirement to learn the new, um, the new practice in uh, landscape archaeology. And then came the 1990s, and there were really a turn for aerial archaeology, a turn that Tony, late Tony Wilkinson really take by funded the Camel Lab in 1998. And this is an interesting quote from uh, proceedings of a conference in aerial archaeology that was published in 2002. The discipline is now much clearer about its aim, which is to read and understand the landscapes of the past and to integrate this information with other forms of evidence from survey and excavation. For too long, it has been seen as a separate specialism, with its focus on discovering new sites, but not using the information it generated. It now plays an important part of landscape archaeology by interpreting and mapping in a way which helps other archaeologists and historians understand sites and landscapes 
which assists their research as well as providing greater validity for conservation and management strategy, and I will come to that a bit later. So in the exhibition, we see the second section that is dedicated to the foundation of CAMEL and the introduction of geographic information system of GIS to uh, IAL archaeology and to landscape archaeology, as well as the importance of the first wave of declassification of Cold War satellite images. Wilkinson was really a visionary when uh, regarding the potential of these ima images when he founded the CAMEL, and one of the aim of the CAMEL lab was to gather as much as um, as most images as possible. And we change of scale again, because during the Cold War, almost the entire West Asia was covered by um, satellite, um, uh, sorry, spy airplane, who took photographs of the area. And they were declassified in 1995, and since then we are uh, using them for studying ancient landscape. So, and thanks also in the 1990s, thanks to the, the, the development of the GIS, we, we are able to uh, put together several kinds of documentation more easily, like ancient maps or the records we make on the grounds with uh, GPS or, um, or total station. And what we can see also in this section is the importance of the fact that these images were taken before or at the very beginning of major changes in the landscape in West Asia. So, so now I will come with um, the heritage and the importance of heritage and of ancient imaging that have preserved images of the past that can have been disappeared today. So this is the example of, uh, the, example of the Temple of Bell in Palmyra, capture, wonderfully captured by Podobar during the 1930s. On the image on the top right, we can still, still see the Temple of Bell, but you can notice in the south of the temple that the old um, part of the city of Tanmore has uh, disappeared. So the, the landscape has already changed in several decades. And then you can see in uh, 2022 that the temple is not there anymore because it has been destroyed in 2015 by ISIS. So these preserved images of the past are really important for monitoring and danger or destroyed heritage. It's, a, it's an important part of the history of IAL archaeology. When we prepare an exhibition, we have to make cho choices. And um, this part is, was very too huge to be advertised in the exhibition, but I, uh, I'm happy to be able to mention it tonight. And now we arrive at the... Um, the last development in aerial archaeology and the new methodology, that the new tool that will bring aerial archaeology in, uh, in the future, will bring aerial archaeology in a new era. I'm talking about artificial intelligence and deep learning. Here you have an example of a large-scale heritage preservation project. And... Um, and the, they, um, they use deep learning to monitor looting in Afghanistan, and they were able to quickly, um, to quickly recognize on the images uh, the, the sites that have been uh, recently looted. And the Camel Lab also is uh, starting to, uh, to develop deep learning very recently. And one of the center is uh, to, since its creation, was to be uh, at the forefront of aerial and landscape archaeology, which they are continue to do today. 
Last thing I would like to mention um, that we, um, it's important to think about our children when we, when we present the past to the general public. And um, it was a great pleasure to, to prepare a booklet for children with a French illustrator, Jérôme Agostini. And uh, you can find the booklet at the bookshop, of course, but I'd like to mention that it is available for free online. So feel free to download it and to share uh, with the people around you. This is for children, but... I'm sure that adults can learn many things in it too. So I invite everyone to, uh, to, to at least have a look. And I would like to thank you for your attention. We haven't tried the pigeon yet in aerial archaeology, but some did. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>